uh, maybe we should give this remark together, Francesco and me. We did a similar thing several years ago with the transition to adulthood. And we split the Italian versus the Austrian sample. I mean, we used the FFS and just wanted to understand how different they are, the Italians and the Austrians, in the transition to adulthood. And I think it's really wonderful, I think, to get back these techniques into demography. And I just can congratulate you. And I think we should apply them more often. And I think it's maybe also something we should step back again, Francesco, <laughs> of this idea. If I may add a personal anecdote, it's a paper author with uh, Alexia in Yuffie, who's Alexia's husband, if I may say. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pure uh, product of, uh, let's say, our interaction plus family. <laughs> uh, it has been very interesting to learn about divergence and convergence of utility talking about determinant of utility. My question is that, is there any consideration on political implication, economic implication of low fertility? Should we consider that in determining optimal fertility? Thank you. to be uh, the expert now, but I, I would really like to, to give the floor to people that know much more about the political implications of low fertility. You know? So uh, I, I'd rather let Maria Rita or, or even Wolfgang answer to this question because uh, their, their knowledge is much more sound than mine, much, much older than Well, of course, there are several implications and uh, I don't know if you mean uh, with political in terms of uh, electorate or in terms of uh, outcomes that we have uh, witnessed uh, in the last uh, decades also, in the last uh, weeks in terms of uh, elections. But uh, I mean, I, I think much more important is to keep uh, a broad overview of all kinds of consequences. And I do think that we should also um, pay attention to economic and social consequences of it, so not stick only on one side. But they, I do see that there will really be differences in terms of... Uh... Well, thank you. We had uh, last week, we are hosting in Vienna a workshop of uh, UNFPA for Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And there, uh, one notion was very prominent. It's now in the government programs of many of these countries, and that's the notion of demographic security. Um, uh, we, I really tried hard to understand what is meant with it. It is uh, a combination of a fear of population decline, uh, population aging, but also fear of immigration. Uh, so it's not just that they have uh, concern about total population decline, they want to have certain kinds of people rather than other people. So it is a, a really sort of very ethnic, uh, national, if not to say nationalistic perspective. <laughs> That is indeed, but that's a matter of fact. I mean, many countries, even to the very neighbor bordering Austria, have very strong feelings in this respect. And I think we just need to sort of better understand and decompose these factors. When um, Eric and I discussed the criteria for optimal fertility, we actually discussed also other possible criteria. We decided to only go for the uh, economic, uh, social security, and sustainability criteria, as well as the environmental criteria. But of course, there are and nationalist feelings. But if you think them to the end, I mean, then if you always want to be bigger or more powerful than your neighbor, then you have an exponential growth of every country growing more rapidly than that. This is just not viable on, on an international basis, but still there are strong feelings uh, in, in this respect. So, yeah, I think we need to take these issues serious as demographers, uh, but there's a limit to what we can do in sort of rational um, demographic analysis. Thanks. Uh, very interesting papers. Uh, can I comment on what you said, Fabienne, at the end? Um, very interesting application of this uh, um, data analysis technique. Um, but at the end, you're gonna, you've shown us one um, decision tree, and you've got hundreds I saw on the 
potentially with all the variables that uh, you might have in the survey. So really, have you escaped from the trap of these uh, multiple and competing theories? If you would actually write down a description of what your analysis has shown, wouldn't you end up with a rather similar but weighted uh, assessment of all these theories that, that, that you put in the first slide? Thank, thank you. This is this is actually a pretty tough a tough one, but, but um, no. I mean, I I think I would I would answer two things. The first thing is it's not um, a perfect substitute to what people have been done before. I mean, again, the, the, the title was meant a bit provocative. There's no world without theory. I mean, if I think I can say if you want to make any kind of start observing things, you have to have a theory in mind from the beginning already. Um, it is on the one hand definitely. Um, a smart approach because if you would like to run models on all those different streams of theory you would need a hundred research assistants and probably a hundred or a thousand different models that tell you different outcomes so I think it's a very effective way and it's meant also to be and that's the second point as a explorative thing so if you want to for example, find an outlier, like, so definitely Hungary is an outlier in this case, otherwise the algorithm would never tell you to make this split. So, it's, it's to explore the data, I think this could be a very valid tool, not only for this, but for also for future social science research. Hi, uh, thank you for your okay? Uh, thank you for the three papers, found them very interesting. Uh, my, my question has to do with well, all these analyses are at the national level. And they're hiding, they're masking the heterogeneity of the populations. And I'm wondering what the theory tells us about the spread of different fertility outcomes amongst different groups in the population, urban versus rural, low versus high education, uh, you name it. So uh, are we going to see conversions there or spread? Or we see we shed some light on that. Sorry, that was addressed to me. Well, our aim is, I mean, if you want to make a parallel, our aim is to see whether there is also a convergence in terms of ideas, whether they, at what we are experiencing in terms of uh, um, family size, actual family size, has also repercussion on ideal family size. If the question is whether we are co moving to a convergence, I mean, there is already a convergence because, as you know, there is this strong uh, two-child family norm that is pervasive. And uh, I would say that in terms of ideals, if uh, I should give you an answer, is uh, we should really try to see whether we will move far away from this convergence, because at least in Europe there is uh, quite uniformity in terms of majority of people reporting as a preference to child. And it was, as I show you, it was rather exceptional, this uh, example of uh, below replacement fertility ideas uh, we observed in Austria and Germany, and it was not confirmed in the subsequent rounds of the Eurobarometer and also uh, by other national surveys. I see Levin in the audience. Uh, there, I think East Asia is, is, is really uh, the area where we are going to see or already seeing this extremely ultra low fertility. And much of the, the Eurobarometer and all the other studies are really using European data, which is a minority. I mean, just think bigger Shanghai is bigger than all the Nordic countries taken together. And there we do have extremely low ideal family size as well as actual family size. Maybe you want to comment a bit on what is known about the state of uh, Chinese <laughs> fertility? Um, Chinese for uh, fertility, uh, um, Shanghai, say for example, is the lowest uh, um, um, in norms of the whole world. And the ideal size um, basically is one. That's probably as one um, of the uh, results of uh, um, 30 years or 20 years, or 30 years of one-child policy. 
but the reality is that it's very expensive to um, to, to to have a child, to, to have all, even only one child. So right now, I think uh, even you have a release of a, a one child policy, and even you in in Shanghai, you already encourage people to have um, the second child, and most people uh, choose not to have. So that's the reality, and I guess uh, this is something like uh, um, in the whole Eastern Asian um, problem uh, are now facing. And um, we don't do a lot of research on this yet, but that's something that's that's a very important um, area that we, we will try to look into, and we will um, collect data and, and to 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 study on this topic. So I can only say this. <laughs> Thank you very much for the insights on Asia. Uh, I will close the session this morning. Thank you very much to the presenters and thank you to the audience.